Hello, YouTube Sidekick here with another installment of It's Not You, It's M.E., my series of videos on the mission editor in DCS. In the last video, we started looking at a mission um, called Welcome to the Ah Dang Valley, which I had made a complete video about, and you can check out that here. Um, we did some pre-mission reconnaissance, and then we placed some targets. And today I kind of want to pick up from there and talk about uh, how I'm going to plan the mission and then how to use the trigger system to put the events in the mission in the proper sequence. So let's take a look at the mission. Uh, here's the basic mission layout. Um, you can see we have the basic landmarks labeled. Uh, we have the targets that we placed last time. And now we also have a plane at Batumi slash Chulai. It's an A4 and it's armed with Zuni rockets. Also, we have a point that is labeled Checkpoint X-Ray at the base of the valley. So, okay. The plan for the mission is kind of as follows. Uh, we want to take off from Chulai. We want to fly to Point X-Ray. Then when we get there, we want to check in with our forward air controller. And they will identify Target 1 for us. We will fly to Target 1 and attack it. And when it's neutralized, the fact will come on again and direct us to go back to X-ray, uh, which we'll do. And then we'll do that two more times. First, we'll attack target two, and then return to X-ray. And then finally, if we get that far, we'll attack target three. So the challenge for the mission is going to be that we have a limited number of Zuni rockets, 16, and we will have to do a minimum amount of damage to each target before we're allowed to go on to the next one. So we need to be efficient enough with our Zunis to make sure that we have enough that we can attack the last target by the time we get it. Now, we have to think about how to set up our triggers to make the mission basically unfold this way. The challenge is that, as we discussed briefly before, uh, while triggers look a little bit like computer code, they really aren't because unlike code, they don't execute in sequence. In other words, um, the order in which the triggers execute during the mission has nothing to do with where they are in the trigger list. So in a case like this, where we want things to happen in a certain order, um, we have to do more than just write the triggers in that order. Um, luckily, there is a way to sequence triggers using flags. And we'll get to that in a sec. But before we do, um, there's one more thing I wanted to do. Um, you see that we have the zone labeled Checkpoint X-Ray. Uh, well, that'll work as a marker for the player, but it won't really work very well as a zone for checking if the player has returned to the initial point because it's pretty small. So I'm going to put down a much larger zone, which will actually be the zone we use to check whether the player has gotten back to the area of X-Ray. Um, and for good measure, let's actually make this a square zone. Um, this is a feature that is reasonably new to DCS. Uh, you can now set a zone to be quad to point, and then you can edit the actual points. So we can make a zone that basically spans the entire base of the valley, and hopefully players will not spend a lot of time hunting around trying to get back to it so they can get their next target. Okay, with that done, it's time to start looking at the triggers we're going to use. Okay, here's a look at the triggers. I've already set up the first few to get us to the point uh, where we're going to be attacking the first target. It's pretty simple. Uh, the first thing we do after the start of the mission is to check if the player is in the initial point zone. Uh, once the player gets there, we add a radio item that allows them to call for a target. And we also give them a message telling them they can start when they're ready. And notice that I've also added a small sound here to make sure that the player sees the message. You can hear what the sound sounds like. It's just a little beep. Okay, so now the player is here and ready to call for his first target. Uh, so let's see what we want to do when that happens. Okay, this is where we start to use our flags to sequence the things. You can see that when the player selects the radio item that we gave him, it's going to set the flag to 10. So we'll use that as the condition that triggers the next set of steps, which basically consists of turning on the first target group, which is called ground one. Uh, and then we want to mark the target with a smoke mark. Now, although you could use a smoke mark directly on the target unit, 
I kind of prefer placing the smoke mark in a zone that I create just so they can offset the smoke a bit to avoid obscuring the target. Um, so let's take a here, take a look here at where I put that zone. Um, note that I'm using the zone list display here um, to find the target one zone and to unhide it for a minute. And then you can see that we have placed it beside the road around the middle of the target. Okay, let's zoom back out and go back to our trigger list. Once we have activated the target and set the smoke mark, uh, what else do we need to do? We need to let the player know what's going on. So there's a series of messages here that do that. And we also want to turn the radio item off. And importantly, we need to turn on the next flag, flag 11, so that that will signal that the activation of the target is complete. Okay, so now the player is set to engage the first set of targets. The next thing we do is just check that when the target has been neutralized, um, so we can send the player back to the initial point and get ready to repeat the process for target two. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that we are only doing this check once flag 11 is enabled, because that's how we know that the target is actually being engaged. Then it's just a matter of checking the target group. Now we could demand that the whole group be destroyed um, as the condition for it being neutralized. Um, but I think that that seems like it would probably be pretty difficult and uh, might prevent uh, the player from getting past this point in the mission very easily. So I've actually chosen to just set the trigger such that it only requires that one truck is fully destroyed in order to trip the trigger. Once the trigger is tripped, it's a simple matter of letting the player know um, and then telling them to go back to the initial point. And then of course we want to set the next flag flag number 12 on so that we know that we have passed this point in the mission sequence. Okay, so that's the basic pattern for each target set up. Now we just have to repeat it uh, for the next two targets. So the first thing we should do is a little bit of housekeeping. And uh, we'll put in another kind of comment line here to keep things cleaned up. And um, then it's just actually a matter of cloning the triggers that we already have and then modifying them a little. Uh, now with this first trigger, the one checking to see if the player is at the initial point, uh, we do need to add a flag to check to make sure that it happens after target one is dead. So uh, we check that flag 12 is on. Um, now, actually, I wanna make a bit of a change here. I kinda wanna split this trigger into two parts. Um, this time, instead of getting the radio item as soon as the player gets to the IP, I'd like there to be a bit of a delay uh, after he gets to the IP um, before the fact calls and gives him the chance to call for the next target. So, so for the first part of the trigger, we'll want to let the player know they're at the IP, and then we'll just set the next flag, in this case, flag 13. And then we'll add another trigger and we'll have it wait a few seconds after flag 13 has been set. And then this will be the one that gives the player the menu item to call for target two. Okay, so we need to get that sorted out and get it labeled properly. And oh, uh, oh oops, I just set it to when the flag was on. Need to go back and set that to a time since flag condition. Okay, and so I think we're set up and I think we're ready now. The player has his menu item so he can call for the second target. And you will note that we are now up to flag 14 in the sequence. Oh, but there's one other thing we have to do. We have to add the messages from Switchblade to let the player know that he can call for the target whenever he's ready. So let's put those in. Oh, and let's not forget to add in our little beep sound.
Okay, rather than go into the process of creating all of those triggers, let's just roll forward a bit here and see what it looks like when we have it all done. So here you can see that we had a trigger to initialize the target, the second target, and that set flag 15. And then we start checking to see if that target has been neutralized. And when it has, that sets flag 16. And that sends the player back to the initial point. And when he gets there, we set flag 17. And then we add the radio item. And when that is accessed, it sets flag 18. And flag 18 triggers this massive set of actions to initiate the last target. And remember, there are three elements in that target, uh, two flak batteries and the supply depot. And then we set flag 19. Oh, and while we're here, we might as well move these sounds up to their corresponding messages. And note that the messages and the sounds are spaced apart by using the start delay parameter. Once flag 19 is set, then we can actually start checking to see whether or not uh, the supply depot has been neutralized. Because if either of the flak batteries is damaged, the player gets a message, but he doesn't get the mission complete message because the objective is to actually kill the supply depot. If he manages to do at least 25% damage to the supply dump, then we send a message and we set flag 100. Or if he manages to do 75% damage, we send him a different message, but we set the same flag 100. And once flag 100 is set, then we send the mission complete message. Okay, one more thing I wanna look at in this video. Uh, is actually how to add a second plane that will allow the player to select an air start instead of a ground start because it does have an effect on the triggers. Okay, now the easiest thing to do here is actually just to copy paste the original plane. Now this will create a copy that is set to take off from runway. Uh, before we can move it, we have to set it to turning point. Uh, oops, and, and then we have to actually grab the right plane. Uh, but once we do, uh, we can put it here in the air, just short of the checkpoint. So players uh, who don't want to start from the ground can start from here instead. Now, because we did the control C, control V thing, the waypoints in the new plane are actually close to the old ones. We only have to tweak them just a little bit. Uh, but there is one, well, or actually three uh, more things we need to do. Because the new plane is a new unit, the triggers that we wrote to check uh, if the player's unit is at the initial point won't work for the new plane. So we have to go into each of those triggers and we just add an OR statement. And then we add two new conditions, uh, essentially replacing the old plane with the new plane. And this will make sure that no matter which one of those planes the player occupies, the trigger will work. Okay, that's going to just about do it for this video, I think. Uh, in this video, we basically looked at how to use triggers to lay out the sequence of events in our mission. Um, I don't really feel like it's that complicated, but you do have to keep track of the flags you're setting, and you have to make sure, basically, that you're getting everything in order um, by making sure you're setting and referring to the right flags in sequence. Um, and as you can see, even with a pretty simple mission like this, um, the triggers can start to uh, proliferate. Uh, but the good thing is that a lot of those triggers and the actions within the triggers are actually just clones of previous ones. So it's, it's not as much work as it might look like to actually put that together. Honestly, for me, the hardest part is not creating the triggers. It's keeping everything organized and making sure I get everything in the right sequence. And honestly, for me, a lot of that is just planning it out ahead of time, maybe even making some notes ahead of time to make sure that I know exactly how I want things to work out. Uh, but the actual, you know, typing the triggers in is not, not really a whole lot of work.
So um, I think I'll probably make at least one more mission editor video from the Welcome to the Audang Valley mission. Because uh, even though the mission script is basically complete, uh, I do want to come in and tweak the way DCS does some things to get some of the effects I want uh, when we actually fly the mission. So um, in the next video in this series, we're going to talk a little bit about triggers that we can use to affect the way DCS handles weapons effects and the damage. So make sure you keep your eye out for that video. And, and if you have not subscribed to the channel, then make sure you subscribe and get those notifications on so you see it when that video comes up. And for now, this is going to be Sidekick, signing off.